fixing a little old house in Anaheim and the garage has been converted to a fourth bedroom. Does VA or FHA require the bedroom to be put back to a garage? John, do you have the answer to that? Because I'm not exactly sure. I think that that's gonna be an issue actually for anyone getting a VA or FHA loan. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> is Sarah on the call? Was I didn't I didn't catch. Was it permitted? It is not permitted, and the garage is being occupied. So, if somebody were to come in with an FHA or VA loan, would it have to be converted back? Well, I don't think the requirement is that you have to have a garage. It's just the concern that a garage is being used as a living space and doesn't meet <laughs> their requirements. Yeah, so it makes me wonder if it could be a requirement that it has to be converted back for an FHA or VLM, considering it's not in conformance with local building guidelines. Do permits have anything to do with it as well, if it was permitted? <laughs> I just think it's an illegal uh, occupancy. And so that that might be the overriding factor. Yeah, no permit. It might be permittable. So Ruth, you're asking the question about FHA or VA, or do you have somebody who's interested that has FHA or VA financing as opposed to conventional financing? It wouldn't count it as square footage for sure. No, they wouldn't count it. You'd be given no credit for it. Okay. I don't hear anything. I don't think she's she's she, really tired. She's muted. She's muted. Ruth, can you unmute? Thank you, Carlos. No, it is not on the market yet. All right. Well, we'll get the answer. How's that? Because I, I don't know for sure, and I don't want to give you something that's incorrect. It could be a concern whether it's FHA, VA, or conventional financing, as a matter of fact, so we'll find out. So today's discussion, well, first of all, good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming today. I see some people here. It's great. People in the background. Okay. Contingencies and contingency removal. So things that we're going to answer today, questions that exist. What happens when the buyer doesn't remove a contingency in writing at the end of the contingency period? What can a seller do if at the end of the contingency period, the buyer doesn't remove the contingency in writing? What happens if a buyer removes all the contingencies and then discovers a material defect in the property prior to the close of escrow and wants to cancel and what exactly is the rule for cancellation based upon the inspection contingency? And then also is a buyer guaranteed to get the deposit back when the buyer properly canceled the contract in good faith? So we're gonna talk about these various issues today among other things. So what is a contingency? Well, really it's just, it provides the party to the contract the ability to condition performance on the occurrence or non-occurrence of an event, for example. So if the buyer is dissatisfied with the results of the physical inspection, they can cancel theoretically because the purchase is conditioned upon them finding the property in satisfactory condition. Maybe the condition could be, I have to qualify for a loan at 6% 6, 6 and that 6% loan is available. Once again, it's a condition. If I can't get a loan at 6%, then I can cancel theoretically. And then one other thing to note in the purchase contract, if you were to look at section eight, all of the default contingencies can be found in section eight. And it's also found under section, we're going too fast here, all right. You go a little bit farther down, there we go, farther. All the contingencies, the default contingencies in the contract are defined under section eight. In addition to that, the grid that everybody's familiar with under section 3L, you'll find the timeframes associated with the contingencies in that section of the purchase contract. 
So the RPA contains eight default contingencies, the loan, appraisal, investigation of property, review of the seller documents, preliminary title report, the common interest disclosures, also known as the HOA docs, review of leased or lien items, and another contingency could be the sale of the buyer's property when form CLP is attached. And you'll find all that referenced in section eight of the purchase contract. So what if somebody wants to add additional contingencies? Can you do that? Well, yes, you can. And there are other car forms, for example, to add contingencies. And for example, maybe the seller might make uh, the sale of their property conditioned upon finding a replacement property. What if it's a short sale? We would attach the short sale addendum. We haven't done this for a long time, but who knows? There could be people that have purchased homes in the last two years. Prices have gone down. Maybe they are, they're highly leveraged. It's their job. We could see some short sale. seller wants a condition that the sale of the property uh, the, the condition is based upon all other individuals signing that purchase contract that have the requirement for the, who are authorized to sign the purchase contract, for example. And then under section three allied in that paragraph. Can a buyer waive the inspecting the right to inspect the property? However, remember, sellers should be aware that whether or not the contingency is waived, they have an obligation to disclose all known material defects. And regardless of the waiver, the listing and selling agent have the obligation to inspect the property. So there's never a waiver if there is a residential unit associated with the property. So one to four residential units, or if it's mixed use and there's a residential unit within the commercial portion. And then of course, the loan contingency, that's also found in section 3L. If you just scan up to there, Carlos. Three L. Now I will say that uh, everybody in this office that writes a purchase contract tends to fill out the information, but for the loan contingency, thank you. Where is the area for the percentage? Percentage is on the first yeah. page. Thank you. Thank you. Right here. Great. Okay. Section E1. Remember, we should always be inserting a maximum interest rate. And we should also be inserting the maximum points that a buyer may pay for the loan in question. So if rates today are six and a half percent, we should probably at least insert a number of six and a half percent, maybe six and three quarters. Let's give some flexibility. And the system does not allow us to put in anything less than one point. So insert one point, because if in the event, the buyer, if we leave that blank, it's possible, regardless of the terms of the loan, the buyer may be obligated to proceed if they do qualify. So always put that in there. And once again, we're creating contingency for our client by putting a, a maximum interest rate and maximum points in that area. So don't leave it blank. The appraisal contingency. So three, if the box is checked, there is no appraisal contingency. And remember, just because if the if the property doesn't appraise, the lender still may be willing to go forward and loan on their property. The buyer may have to come in with additional money. So it doesn't mean anything beyond that. But also the other thing that we want to talk about, and it's not as prevalent today, but the appraisal gap. Don't want to weigh the. We in that area, the dollar amount of nine hundred eighty thousand dollars. So what that's telling the seller is 
contingency as the means for cancellation of the contract. Now, what about in the event, and, and let's assume we make an offer for a million, we insert $980,000 into that block, and then there's a counter offer, and the counter offer is in two, and it's accepted. Well, the appraisal, the appraisal amount is now going to be, in our example, a million eighty. So we're soon. To, and you'll see this on the counter offer that twenty thousand dollars represents the or more for the buyer to not be able to use the appraisal contingency to cancel the transaction. If the appraisal comes in less than a million one eighty, then the buyer can cancel based upon the appraisal contingency. They're saying that your voice is, is breaking up. It cuts off and on. Is it going through that as opposed to my computer? Let's try it. How does it sound now? Any better? Uh, can you guys even hear us? Uh, can you hear us? That's yes, much better. Okay. okay. Thank you for letting me know that. I'm sorry about that. I didn't know. Okay. And then let's move on to non-optional contingencies. And there are non-optional contingencies on the purchase contract. And one, for example is for residential properties built before 1978. Federal law does require that the buyer be given a lead hazard information pamphlet, that the seller disclose the presence of any known lead-based paint and provide a statement to be signed by the buyer stating the buyer has read the warning statement, has received the pamphlet, and has a 10-day opportunity to inspect before becoming obligated under the contract. So the buyer's right to conduct a lead hazard inspection is a contingency of the contract required by federal law, unless the buyers had the opportunity to conduct the inspection before execution of the purchase contract. So that is a non-optional contingency, pre-1970 property. So, and that's associated with federal lead-based paint disclosures. And why do we give them the booklet? Well, and we give them a booklet and everybody wonders, well, why am I just giving a booklet? Well, we really don't know if the client or the buyers receive the booklet unless they sign the, Fed, the form FLD. That's the only evidence we have that they have received the booklet. And it insulates the seller and us from any litigation associated with claims of lead-based paint that not being disclosed. Then also an, another non-optional contingency would be the TDS. So if the seller doesn't give the buyer a TDS when obligated to do so, courts have held that the buyers do not have to proceed with the transaction. And of course, that's true unless the seller is exempt from providing a TDS. And there's very few exemptions as a matter of fact. So the TDS can be waived, but of course the only way we can do that per se is to give them the TDS before they submit an offer for the property. And to give some demonstration, there's case law, for example, in which somebody was occupying a residential porches, uh, portion of a building. So it was a mixed use property. They occupied the property for two years, as a matter of fact. Then they were in a purchase contract to acquire the property. The seller never gave them the TDS and allowed the buyer, even though they had full knowledge of the property, to cancel the transaction. So that's how critical the TDS is. If the buyer closes without receiving a TDS, can they rescind the transaction following the close of escrow? No, they can't. But the seller theoretically could be liable for any undisclosed deficiencies in the property. And then can a seller insist that a buyer have no contingencies? Yes, you can do that. And if we go to section 3L, Maybe I got it right this time, huh? This is uh, 
three L. Let's say investigation. All right, removal or waiver of contingencies. So the buyer can submit a non-contingent offer. Check the box. We had attached contingency removal form, but it still is a misnomer because once again, we have the non-optional contingency of the lead-based paint disclosure, right? Which is non-optional. If we don't have the, if we don't provide the booklet, have the form signed and give them the opportunity to conduct a lead-based paint inspection before the contract is submitted, the contingency is going to be there subsequent to execution. On the contract. And then they have 10 days. To, if you don't give them the transfer disclosure statement and related disclosures before submission of the purchase contract, it is going to be an offer that is not completely non contingent. So once the TDS are disclosures, it opens up the rescission period and a buyer could cancel. My internet connection is unstable, it said. Yeah. And then short sales, it's possible we might see short sales as we mentioned before. And let's assume that there is one and the outstanding encumbrances exceed the value of the property. Well, we should be submitting a short sale addendum with the offer, or if you don't, the seller should be responding with a short sale addendum. And a short sale addendum states that it requires all lenders approval within a certain time frame, and if the lenders haven't agreed to the short sale, following the passage of time, it sounds like Kamala Harris, right? <laughs> <laughs> then either party can cancel. So keep that in mind. <clears throat> and then how are contingencies removed? Well, they're removed actively. So in every single car purchase contract, all contingencies are removed actively. That means the buyer must perform something or sign a contingency removal form for those contingencies to be removed. They're just not going to be removed with the passage of time or automatically. And then must the buyer remove a contingency regarding a disclosure that the buyer has not yet received from the seller. So if the seller has not provided the disclosures, must the buyer remove the contingency? The answer is no. So even if the contingency period is passed under section 14B3 of the contract, if any report, disclosure, or information for which the seller is responsible is not delivered within the time specified in 14A, the buyer may actually receive more time to remove that contingency. So in our example, if the seller did not provide the required seller disclosures, they cannot mandate that the buyer remove those contingencies associated with those disclosures. And then if in the event it's provided at a later date, the buyer has the opportunity of a contingency period equal to the default time frame and the contract for the most part is 17 days, or they could have a contingency period equal to five days following receipt of the seller disclosures. And we'll go through a couple of examples. So if the contingency period ended on Wednesday and the days of the week are important, July 7th, but the seller gave the buyer a seller property questionnaire on Friday, July 9th, remember the 17th day ends on July 7th, but the seller delivered the disclosures on the 9th, then the buyer would have five days following from the 9th, that means until the 14th, to remove the contingencies. So remember the contingency period is equal to the default time frame shown on the contract or five days following receipt of the required disclosure. So if you're representing a seller, you need to be on top of delivery of those disclosures. You're representing a buyer, obviously just understand the contingency period because we don't wanna remove contingencies without being required to do so. So on the other hand, if the contingency period ends on Wednesday, July 7th, but the seller gave the buyer the seller property questionnaire on Thursday, July 1st. So remember the 17th day ends on the 7th. Seller gave the disclosures on July 1st. The buyer has until Wednesday, July 7th to remove the contingency. Remember, the greater of five days following receipt of the disclosures or the time frame shown on the contract in terms of the contingency period. 
Do we have any questions on that? No. To be sure. Okay. Another example. So if the contingency period ended on Wednesday, July 7th, but the seller gave the buyer the seller property questionnaire on Tuesday, July 6th, so one day before the 17th day, then actually this is Monday, July 12th, to remove the contingency. Remember, if the fifth day or the 17th day falls on a weekend or legal holiday, the buyer gets the benefit to, re, to execute or perform based upon the following business day. So if the time frame expires on a Saturday, Sunday, or legal holiday, then the execution of that event actually falls to the following business day. So they would actually have six days more to remove that contingency. So the additional five days that we're talking about, would that apply to, to the preliminary title report? Yes, it would. So if the seller delivered the preliminary title report on day 17, realistically, the buyer's gonna have until five days following the 17th day to remove the contingency for the preliminary title report. And that's going to be true for the TDS, the NHD, Miller Root. This fire home disclosure advisory, for example. And then keep in mind, the TDS gives rise to a rescission period also. So that's something else to keep in mind. So what happens when the buyer doesn't remove a contingency in writing at the end of the contingency period? Well, the contingency continues in full force. So it means the contingency just lives on. So if the buyer, we're at the 17th day and the buyer does not remove the contingencies, unless the seller delivers a notice of reform, the contingency just lives on. Keep that in mind. When you're representing a seller, we don't want the contingencies to continue into an indefinite period of time. And then notice to perform. So let's assume we know the contingency period just expires or it's, we're approaching the 17th day. What can we do? We can deliver a notice to perform two days in advance of the expiration of the contingency. And if the contingent 17th day, for example, falls on a Saturday or Sunday, all we'll do is just count back two days. And that's as soon as we can deliver a notice to perform to remove that contingency. If you deliver a notice to perform any sooner than two days before the expiration of the contingency, then delivery of the notice to perform would be defective and you'd have to re-deliver a notice to perform. And if you, because the default time frame in the contract is two days following delivery of the notice to perform, if you if deliver a notice to perform and say you have one more day only to remove the contingency, that also would be defective. You can't reduce or modify the contract Remember, once you deliver a notice of reform, the other party has two days to actually execute or act on that demand. And then likewise, if a contingency ex continues on contractually, the buyer only has 17 days to conduct actual inspections and to access the property. So if the contingency lives on for 23, 25 days, that does not necessarily mean that the buyer can continue to access the property. So the seller doesn't have to grant further access after that. So the access to the property, which is not a contingency of the transaction, is not granted additional time if the contingency itself becomes much longer. And it is closing escrow contingency of the purchase contract. No, it is not. It's actually a covenant or condition of the purchase contract. So if the buyer does not close on time, what may the seller do? Well, the seller, based upon the contract, can deliver a demand to close escrow. Likewise, if the seller refuses to close escrow, doesn't sign a grant deed, for example, what can the buyer do? The buyer can deliver a demand to close escrow. Delivering a notice of reform would not be the appropriate method to force the other party to live up to their contractual obligation in that case.
And then we talked about active and passive removal. Remember, all the car contracts require active removal, meaning the buyer must sign a contingency removal form. Or likewise, if the seller is made the sale of the house predicated upon refining a replacement property, they must sign a contingency removal form to remove that contingency. So now what happens if a buyer removes all the contingencies and then discovers a material defect in the property prior to the close of escrow and wants to cancel? Well, realistically, I think the question comes down to they want to cancel and not be in breach of contract. That's the concern in every single case. They're concerned about losing their money. Well, the buyer can cancel, but whether or not they're risking their deposit, that's another aspect that we need to address. So one possibility, so once again, contingencies are removed, the buyer now discovers that there's a defect. So one possibility is that the seller was aware of the defect, but didn't disclose it to the buyer. So that could be a breach of the seller's obligation to disclose material facts and truthfully answer the questions on all the seller disclosures, for example, the TDS and SPQ. So assuming it is a material defect, the buyer may be able to cancel without breaching the contract. But another possibility pertains to the buyer's cancellation rights under paragraph 11A4, <clears throat> and that arises when the seller becomes aware of adverse conditions, so affecting the property, or maybe it's, a, it's a, an inaccurate response to the disclosures. So if the seller's newfound information re relates to a disclosure that they provided, the seller is obligated to redisclose the fact that this deficiency exists. So once, if the seller rediscloses, then that opens up the rescission period for the buyer. And if that redisclosure occurs through personal delivery, the buyer has three days to rescind the contract. There's a big difference between rescind and cancellation. Or if it's delivered via mail or email, then the buyer has a five-day right of rescission. What's what's an example of something like that that would that would come up later in the transaction? Uh, maybe there's a slab leak. If the, if the buyer is not able to go in after 17 days to look at the property, how would like? No, no. The seller realizes in this in my example that I failed to disclose that there was yeah. a slab leak in the property. And why would that be important? Well, they may not be able to eventually, or their insurance premiums could be much higher. And nonetheless, it may cause somebody to decide that I'm not going to go far because it, once there's a slab leak, it could mean that there's going to be more slab leaks also, <clears throat> even if the insurance company is not going to charge them additional money at this point in time. So that's something that we would see happen uh, because once there's a failure in the system, it's likely it's going to continue to fail, as a matter of fact. So that could be a material event for somebody. Do they have to repipe the house? Uh, quite possibly. Otherwise, it may not be insurable. There's never a guarantee that the buyer's always going to get all their money back. That's a question that I would address today, but I mean, since you brought that up. If the redisclosure, the buyer will, will cancel because it's high interest. I would say that the likelihood the buyer's going to recover their deposit, excluding any cost the buyer incurred, is high, exceptionally high. Yes. So then what happens if, in my example, the buyer removed all contingencies and then found out, maybe through their insurance company, as they're investigating the cost of their insurance premiums, that maybe their insurance claims associated with that property and there was a slab leak, but the seller never disclosed it. <clears throat> if the buyer comes across the information through a third-party report, or if the buyer discovers it on their own, that does not open up the rescission period. Meaning the buyer may not be able to cancel the purchase of that home without being in breach of contract. So any third party report that the buyer obtains that indicates deficiencies that weren't disclosed. But would that make the seller in breach of contract for not disclosing that? Well, that's a good question. The, the dispute, could, could the buyer theoretically cancel without being in breach? Based upon the contract, if they discover that through a third-party report, 
or if they discovered efficiency on their own, the rescission period's not open. They're aware now. Does it Theoretically, the seller should redisclose, but if they don't redisclose it after the buyer said, hey, I found out that there's a slab leak, I want you to submit a new disclosure to me. If they don't, the buyer may not be able to cancel without being in breach of contract. So they'd have to close and then maybe the buyer can- uh, Maybe, right? And then it's, it's a problem. Yeah. It becomes a real problem as a matter of fact, because that can be a very expensive aspect to, to address. Mm -hmm. So third party reports are very, very critical in regards to what's taking place. And then what if uh, the buyer removed all their contingencies and then they're doing their final walkthrough and they notice the defect that really was visible to everybody? If it's something that's visual and apparent to everybody, they probably can't cancel without being a breach of contract. So there is no simple solution. What we don't want to do, if we can avoid it, if we find out that there is a deficiency that the seller didn't disclose, my opinion would be to counsel the seller and say, redisclose, let them cancel. They may sue you after the fact because they're gonna claim that you didn't disclose these deficiencies in the property. I would take that approach as opposed to saying, Oh no, enforce the contract, make them close escrow because I think that buyer is going to be very unhappy and they're probably going to be coming at the seller and us, as a matter of fact. And that recommendation should be in writing, correct? So it should be in writing. Record. So we should let them know. They should be speaking with their attorney to be sure that they're taking the correct approach. But I would suggest that redisclosure, even though the transaction may fail, is probably the best approach as opposed to subsequently being engaged in litigation thereafter. And then also when you're helping your clients, remember you should be looking all those disclosures. If you see errors in the disclosures, you should notify them and ask them to amend those disclosures. We had that discussion with the attorney from a professional li liability carrier. So we should be making sure that they understand that there, if there's errors, we should re-disclose. And we would do that, for example, just by writing, if it's the TDS or SPQ, right, amend it across the top, date it, and the seller resigns, but it does not require the agents to resign those disclosures. So there's no reason if we become aware to not do that. However, if the seller becomes aware, of, excuse me, the buyer becomes aware of a defect through a third party report, I would not take it upon the seller to redisclose. The buyer is now aware. Do they want to allow the buyer to cancel? That's a good question. Something that they may have to give consideration to. Depending upon how material the deficiency is, I think that's what's going to dictate what's taking place. Let's see. And then can the buyer cancel on the basis of an open contingency? Absolutely. So if I have released my contingency for the loan, I could cancel if I can't get the loan. But remember, keep in mind, let's, the appraisal is probably the, the simplest example I can use. I have released my appraisal contingency. The appraised value came at came in at the purchase price, that contingency has now been satisfied. So just because I don't wanna release the appraisal contingency is meaningless because the appraised value came in at the purchase price. Likewise, if I can get the loan, I can't cancel based upon the loan contingency because that contingency has been satisfied. I'm approved for the loan. And an appraisal, if the square footage indicates something far less than the square footage that's been represented on the MLS, how would you cancel that transaction? Would you base it upon the appraisal contingency? Would you base it upon the investigation contingency? Well, I'm gonna tell you. <laughs> if the square footage comes in less on the appraisal, you would, base, you would cancel based upon the investigation contingency. The appraisal is simply that. It is the estimate of value or opinion of value. So something else in that, and that appraisal indicates something different than what was disclosed to the buyer. That's going to be the investigation contingency as the basis for cancellation. It's pretty tricky, right? It is. <laughs> yeah, because you cancel based upon the appraisal, the square footage, you're in breach. And then also, 
a client or a principal cannot cause their own contingency to fail. So I don't want to go through the purchase and I, and I release all my other contingencies, excluding my loan contingency. I'm going to be so smart. I'm not going to provide the bank statements to the lender who requested it. And now they deny my loan based upon the fact that I did not provide all the required documentation. Well, that's going to be a problem. And of course, the declination letter issued by the lender is going to indicate that. So you couldn't cancel based upon the loan contingency. And if it goes to uh, mediation or arbitration, I can assure you the other party is going to request that documentation. Got one right now, as a matter of fact. They don't want to give that documentation. Hmm. <laughs> and they cancel based upon the loan, even though they had a full approval. So remember, you can't cancel once the contingency has been satisfied. And that means releasing it and or if it's been fulfilled. Uh, one other thing I would suggest, uh, if you have a client and the the buyer wants to be present at the time the appraisal is taking place. I would suggest that you do not allow them to be present because at some point, if they cancel and the appraisal didn't come in, the other party may contest the validity of that appraisal. They may say that the buyer improperly influenced the appraiser. So I would not allow my buyer to be present and speaking to the appraiser. Keep that in mind. And then the inspection contingency, if there's going to be a cancellation, first of all, the buyer probably should not just focus on one thing. If the buyer wants to cancel based upon the inspection contingency, there's probably going to be a broad area of items. Do you actually have to disclose that, what those items are? No. If we're going to cancel, then we would just say it's subject to paragraphs 8 and 14 of the RPA. That's what we would do, as a matter of fact. And then keep in mind, the law is so broad in terms of reasons for a buyer in terms of cancellation. Plus, if you look at the form BIA, the buyer inspection addendum, which is attached to the purchase contract, it is a laundry list of different items falling under the inspection contingency. And it's so broad together with the law itself, it's likely that the buyer could find a valid reason under the inspection or investigation contingency to cancel the transaction. Let's say, for example, if there's termites. Well, even though the seller is willing to correct the termite infestation, could the buyer cancel? Yeah, I think they could, right? I don't like termites. And I don't believe that they're gonna be gone completely. So that could be a valid reason. You don't have to give the answer, but at mediation or arbitration, you probably will be giving the answer in terms of why you actually did cancel. And then, Randy, you asked the question, is the buyer guaranteed to get the deposit back when they properly cancel? There's never any guarantee that a buyer is going to get their deposit back, highly likely. So when that question comes up, we should never tell our clients that they are fully entitled to get their deposit back. I would say it would be rare if they canceled in good faith, but... Let's never tell them that they're going to get their deposit back, as a matter of fact. Does anyone have any questions about that? Did I cover everything that maybe everybody would be interested in? Yes. <laughs> Should be interested. I heard some sound back there, as a matter of fact. <laughs> so just to review a couple of things, Delivery of the TDS is a requirement and it's not considered complete unless the agent, the listing agent completes their diligent visual inspection and it can be accomplished in a couple of ways. They can complete the section in page three of the TDS. They could simply write in what their inspection consisted of. But as they check the box that they're going to attach an AVID, they must attach the AVID to the TDS and being delivered. Otherwise, delivery of the TDS is not considered complete and the rescission re period remains open. Until the AVID gets- delivered. Correct, until the AVID would be delivered in, in that example, as a matter of fact. So even if 
All contingencies are removed and the seller then delivers a TDS, it opens up the rescission period. Now it states that the buyer can just cancel, but the buyer better have a valid reason for cancellation. So delivery of all those seller disclosures, it's critical in the whole process, especially if there are short contingency periods. That seems to be uh, something that's not applicable today. But before we had contingency periods of seven and 10 days, well, it probably wasn't enforceable because the seller didn't deliver the disclosures until day seven. So we know that the buyer actually has the greater of the contingency period or five days following receipt of those disclosures. Uh, interesting thing, when you look at inspections or reports, it appears as if delivery of the um, pest control report could be the buyer's obligation itself. Now, we may assign who's paying for that to the seller, but they're not the ones who are necessarily delivering the report. So that could be something else to give consideration to. So which there could be multiple contingency removals throughout the transaction, and there could be multiple notice to buyer to perform uh, throughout the transaction as well, right? Yes. For the new agents that don't know. Of course, right. So not all contingencies have to be removed concurrently. I think that's what you're getting at. So maybe at the 17th day, your client's willing to remove the investigation contingency, but they don't have loan approval and they're not willing to remove the loan contingency. So that's reasonable. Remove all of the contingencies, excluding the loan contingency. That would be a valid approach. Richard, what, what we discussed here when to company? Actually, the contract uses the term as is, so that the property is being sold as is. So yes, seller has an obligation to disclose any and all deficiencies. They're never relieved of that obligation and nor is the agent relieved of their obligation to conduct uh, a diligent visual inspection. Uh, Richard? Yes. Um about the loan contingency removal. So isn't there a danger if they don't the buyer doesn't remove the loan contingency on time? Um, doesn't that give an excuse to the seller to cancel the buyer? To yes, it does. It does. Absolutely. But once again, um, if the seller doesn't deliver a notice to perform, right. then the contingency will just live on. But you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. That is the risk if the buyer does not remove the loan contingency within the, the time frame prescribed in the contract. Okay. And what if after the 17 days, he doesn't re remove the loan contingency? Well, then we have the notice to perform. And if he doesn't still deliver it because he's unsure if it's going to get funded, then, okay, then he can get his deposit back once the deal cancels, correct? Well, so you said once again that the buyer has not re removed the loan contingency, correct? And then receiving the notice to perform. Right. And he does not perform. He does not remove it yet within the time frame. Then the seller will cancel the contract, correct? Correct. And at this point, does he get his, is, is there assurance that he gets his um, deposit back? No, no, there's never any assurance. And then the question uh -huh. I would have, <laughs> the question, I think it's likely, the question I would have, was a loan approval issued? So let's assume that loan approval was not issued and the seller canceled that suggests that the loan contingency was never fulfilled. So realistically, the buyer should be entitled to get their deposit back. But what if, in your example, the 17 days passes, the seller issues a notice to perform, and then that time passes, then the seller cancels, and actually the buyer did have loan approval. The condition has been satisfied, or the, the, the contingency has been satisfied. If I'm a seller and I have the thought that that has occurred, then I might contest releasing the deposit. Right. And I'm gonna to wanna to see the declination letter right. or I wanna see, I want evidence at what stage that loan is in. 
And likewise, if you cancel based upon the appraised value not coming in, the buyer's gonna have an obligation at that point to provide a copy of the appraisal to the seller to validate their reason for cancellation. Okay, thank so, you. Sure, sure. Rich, if a seller gives a notice to buyer to perform and then they 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 wait, they go past the two days that, that they're required and let's say it's five days and they're just giving, giving them extra days. They can cancel it any time after those two days, right? Not, not specifically two days, three days after on the third day. Uh, yes, I'm gonna make sure everybody heard Carlos's question. If I do deliver a notice to perform and the two days lapses, must I cancel then? No, the seller doesn't have to cancel. And he said, well, what if five days passes? Could I cancel then? I would say yes. But what if a month passes? Although the contract doesn't address it, it does state time is of the essence. Well, maybe I probably, if I'm the seller in that case, I would deliver another notice to perform because actually time is not of the essence of me. I gave you a notice to perform, then I allowed a month to lapse. Obviously timing didn't mean anything to me. So I would be err on being conservative and delivering another notice to perform if a substantial amount of time had lapsed from the time I delivered the first notice to perform and when I really intended to cancel. So there's never any question about what's taking place. And then even delivery of the notices, keep in mind that the designated delivery address found on the signature page for the agent, it's ideal if you have that information completed is that they might contest that they never received those notices, but the designated delivery address, I don't think we have that on there, do we? Yeah, so there is no contesting it because everybody is agreeing that if anything is sent to that designated delivery address, delivery has occurred. So that's very important. So does that mean that the seller, if that was the case, um, the delivery was performed again? So if they do, the buyer do lose their photographer. Good. Because yeah, the buyer's going to find it. Yeah. <clears throat> And then um, mediation is going to be at least four hours for each part. You know, they're paying and they're most likely they're going to have legal counsel. So it's going to be expensive. Mediation isn't binding. And it's rare that I ever see anybody leave mediation in which they've come to a conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> The two words don't go hand in That's hand. That's right. <laughs> it, never, it never goes hand in hand. So typically what I see then are the attorneys after the mediation has ended then continue with the discussions. So everybody's still paying. Yeah, very unfortunate. So disclosures, it's important. So remember, read over those seller disclosures. It's important. You should be looking and remember that the advice we got from counsel was that every paragraph and every document you should review. Seems like a real burden. <laughs> Carr actually has another disclosure now that states in which the buyer is stating and signing that I have read every document. I don't know if it means anything, but, <laughs> but that's the extent that we're going to to try to protect ourselves. Any other questions? Anything in the chat box? Doesn't look like it. Okay. Well, thank you for attending, everybody. It's good to see you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everybody.